Ho, 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 we made this. Welcome to Chucky Vision, the podcast about Chucky, Child's Play, and all other things kill a doll, here on the We Made This Podcast Network. My name is Mark Adams, and I am one of your regular hosts. With me at this time, in a short while, will be my co-host Dev, but I'm just here to do a quick intro explaining why he's not here with me now, and what we're actually doing over the next week or so on Chucky Vision. So we are planning our big, fat, Christmassy, special, etc. Where we have a Season 2 roundup, where we look at various aspects of Season 2 of Chucky, and that included lots of different segments. However, we are recording some of those segments later on this week, when we see each other in person, because we're going to go and see a drag show together. And we had a few pre-recorded things that we were going to use in a gigantic episode. However, we've had a rethink and the two chats that we've had with guests, we've decided we're going to release as separate episodes because we think they have real value beyond just the pair of us going chucky, 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 chucky. We want to be really self-indulgent and look at our Twitter polls, etc, etc, etc. So the roundup episode isn't going to have our chats about non-binary representation with Cam or Catholicism representation with YG, they're going to be released as separate episodes. And this is the first one of those, where we have a sit-down and a conversation with our friend from New Orleans, Cam, a regular listener to the show who has said lots and lots of kind words about us, and we think they're brilliant. And so this is our chat where we discuss the non-binary representation in Series 2 of Chucky. So the two major themes, or at least as we saw it, within Chucky Series 2 were Catholicism and non-binary people and the depiction therein. Our guest to talk about the depiction of the non-binary characters within Series 2 of Chucky is Cam Munro. Hello, Cam. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Mark. Hi, Dev. How are you? We're very good. Really good, thanks. So as we do, we always do a... Chucky Vision questions for our guests. So are you ready for the four questions that we have? Yes, I am. Okay, so first up is how did you first encounter Chucky? Okay, that's actually a really hard one because my memory is so (laughs) awful, but I remember being terrified as a kid because I always associated Chucky with Beetlejuice. And my dad used to let me watch Beetlejuice all the time. And I used to have a Beetlejuice doll with a little pole. So Beetlejuice and Chucky were just like very together but i didn't really get into it until bride of tech right okay and so chucky wasn't in beetlejuice did someone else mention beetlejuice recently dev you mentioned beetlejuice on our catholicism talk yeah did i i thought we had good grief you brought it up as a one of your childhood fears oh yeah it scared the shit out of me as well (laughs) we literally just talked about that what a coincidence (laughs) so what is your favorite chucky film is it bride or have you subsequently seen something you like more okay i love bride as like a camp movie but my favorite that i has a lot of rewatch value is cult of chucky that one is my favorite i love a rewatch of that that's not what i would have guessed but i i genuinely think that it's really interesting those two films curse and cult It's almost like the franchise has phases. It has the classic slasher phase, which is the first three. Then it has the kind of comedy, ironic phase, which is Bride and Seed. And then it has what I would almost call a renaissance with Cult and Curse. But 
it then goes back kind of to the campery again in the television series. <laughs> Would you say that's fair, both of you? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I really like Colt. I really, really enjoyed Colt the uh, first time I saw it. It definitely feels like a prelude to the TV show because it has so many subplots going on with Nika and Andy and Tiffany that you have to see the early films to fully understand and enjoy. And it does feel like the um, like the school setting of season one and the church setting of season two, where this was like the asylum setting. So, yeah, when we first looked at those two films, we gave them a lot of praise. But I think as time goes by, I think I actually like them even more. I think they're remarkable films and they're not just a transition between seed being a failure and the television series being a success i think they're really quite special in the franchise and i still don't think they would be my favorite because bride of chucky's got that soundtrack but they're (laughs) bloody close agreed so the third question is what is your favorite chucky moment across all of the films or the telly Okay, that's a difficult one. I didn't even have anything prepared because I, but I do know that every single time I would be like, okay, what's your favorite moment? It always is way as Nika in cult. Like it's so <laughs> weird. And he's like, I'm gonna come back for you. And I'm like, are you really gonna come back for this lady? And it's like, yeah, he sure does. But I always just way as Nika. It lives rent free in my brain. I say it at work. I say it when I'm washing the dishes. Like I pick up a knife and I'm like, way as Nika. What? <laughs> and then always like you know glass smashing mirrors coming down on people but then it's like look around with the glass way as nika <laughs> <Whatever. laughs> it also may be because i have like a crush on fiona dorf but it's whatever <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> if i was gonna have a crush on a woman it might have to be fiona Dorf. oh she oh everything either that or tia carrera in wayne's world Oh, that's a good one, too. <laughs> it's a very questionable c- crush. That the crush, is even, the crush is even stronger when she's impersonating her own dad. Oh, my God. Why? Because <laughs> it's so true. And I'm just like, this is... Well, at least I have one part of my identity crisis down so I can focus on another one. Thank you. Was, what? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it really is so hard to be queer, isn't it? <laughs> like it is, but then it's very free because it's like opportunities abound. There's a lot of possibilities <laughs> going on. Is Fiona Dourif gay or bi or do we know? I don't know. I don't think <laughs> so. Not in real life. I'm not sure. I try not to look into it because I try not to get weird about it. <laughs> I mean, in my head canon, Orlando Bloom is definitely gay. (laughs) (laughs) Moving on, who is your favourite character across all of the Chucky films and TV? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, It's either going to be Nika or Tiffany, honestly. Do you generally resonate towards the female characters or is it just because they're both so fucking brilliant? (laughs) Well, Nika specifically because of the duality between her her playing not only her dad, but then playing like her dad and herself. Like I was like, whoa, because I look exactly like my dad and my mom calls me my dad's name sometimes. So I <laughs> oh, wow. I was like, I felt a little bit of resonance with that. But then Jennifer Tilly, I mean, it's Jennifer Tilly. And then <laughs> Tiffany is Tiffany. And I'm just like, I get it both. I get it all. I really do. Yeah. <laughs> How did you yeah. get on with the um, revelation of Jennifer Tilly being stuck in the dolls <laughs> in Seed of Chucky? I could not believe. I thought that <laughs> she was just gone. But it, it kind of made it a little more tragic because you've spent your whole life in a cage as a doll begging for chocolate and still working. <laughs> No, that's not Voicing fair. Voicing the characters. Right, you're doing all of this work where you could have easily been voicing the characters and be like, hi, I'm stuck in a doll, somebody help me. No, she's just like, I'm just going to do it, eat this chocolate and hope for the best. <laughs> and then the savagery of just... Now, I've thought about this subsequently. It's very similar to the death of David in Bride of Chucky. And I hadn't even thought about it when we did the episode on episode seven of... 
Chucky series two. But subsequently, I'm like, it's so similar to David's death. And that just came out of nowhere as well. And it was a really, a really lovely character that everyone really liked. And poor Jennifer Tilly, poor David. They were done dirty. <laughs> Ever since uh, Final Destination, if you ever need to get rid of a, a character, just have them have an argument by a street. <laughs> there will always be a bus waiting. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Awful. <laughs> And it's sad to laugh because it's death by a bus. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, th- there is that cliche, isn't there? D- you know, YOLO, because you can get hit by a bus tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, I-, I-, I regularly use that as a reason to spend money on dumb shit. But I think it's become really kind of tropey, yet it still shocked me when Jennifer Tilly in the doll got so horrifically killed by accident. All right, shall we move on and have a quick chat about what's going on in series two with regards to the depictions of the non-binary characters? And I think to some extent, a few people might argue that the end of Seed of Chucky, whilst well-meaning, was perhaps not exactly how we would have liked our non-binary siblings to be referenced as or, or, or seen as. But I think what we would need before we go into a discussion about that, Cam, can you give us a kind of like a ladybird book with pictures description of what non-binary means and what it means to you as a non-binary person? Sure. Non-binary is basically this term for people who do not identify as the gender that they are assigned with at birth. So... They don't necessarily feel like they are a man. They don't necessarily feel like they are a woman. They may feel like, you know, depending on their cultural background, they may identify as two-spirit or, you know, something of the like. But basically just a rejection of a binary identity as opposed to just being a person instead of what your body is, it's who you are. That's basically how I've come to see it and understand it and evoke it and so how did you engage with being non-binary when you realize that that is what you are it's kind of always been a thing I just never had a term for it I was always told I had very masculine energy but I'm you know assigned female at birth but I've always like been very comfortable dressing as a guy, but then I definitely can dress very womanly, I guess, quote unquote. It's just evoking all of those things was natural for me. So then coming up in the queer community and moving around a lot and then having access to Tumblr, Instagram, Twitter, like that's how I got my education to learn about books. It's not like they were presented to me in person. The internet has kind of always been where I've learned everything. So then learning about these identities and maybe for a while, okay, am I trans? No, I'm not. You know, having to go through educating myself and then finding what more, not even easily resonated, but naturally resonated. Is there anywhere that you might be able to recommend for our listeners if they think that they may be non-binary and they're questioning? Is there anywhere online that you would consider a safe space that they might want to go to? Yes, Alok V. Menon is an incredible non-binary person who has a book called Beyond the Gender Binary, and they are amazing. They do talks all around the world. They have a very interesting history with the queer community as far as like their family has also pioneered a lot of stuff. It's amazing how much this person knows and how empathetic they are when they're receiving like hate online. They're like, I respond with like love. Like, why do you feel the need to hurt me? Like they don't come at them with anger. It's difficult because I'm like, this person is taking so much abuse just on the chin consistently with not ever having any anger. And I'm just like, that is, that's where I go. That's great. Thank you. You're welcome. The best bet is to start at where at least makes the most sense to me. And it is the end of Seed of Chucky. At the time, I 
certainly didn't know what non-binary was. I knew what trans was, but... Seed of Chucky is such an old film now, which I did watch at the time. I didn't see it at the cinema. I saw it when it was released on video, VHS. Fucking hell. And um, <laughs> it didn't seem wrong to me at the time. But looking at it with more enlightened eyes, with an education about who my non-binary siblings are and what the film meant to them anyway, did you find the ending particularly problematic at the time? Has your opinion changed? Do you think that they've kind of made up for it with series two? When I watched it, I don't know if I watched it directly after it came out. It may have taken me some time to get to it, but I don't think I initially had a reaction because then on a rewatch recently, I was like completely, it was like I was watching a brand new movie, like for the first time. So my feelings were a little bit of confusion, but I was like, okay. And then I watched it again the other day and I was like, Hmm. that sets it up for what happens now because I'd already seen season two and then rewatched Seed and I was like oh but I don't particularly know if I found it problematic in any way it may have just been an interpretation may it be ill-informed just an interpretation of an experience because you can't really define it yeah would you say it was ill-informed or would you say it was reflective of the time like I say I had no idea what non-binary was and at the time I found effeminate men very attractive and I think a lot of the people now that I was finding attractive then would probably now identify as non-binary so it's a weird one I know it was done with love and I know it was done in a way that was supposed to be very positive for people who were questioning their identity So the film wasn't one that, for you personally, was something that mattered for its representation at the time? No, because I don't don't think I understood really what it was doing because I wasn't as informed as I am now to have that kind Mm. of reaction to it, you know? That's why when I... When I look at it with my lens now, I'm like, it's different. But as a historical piece, do you feel like it has value or do you feel it is so outdated that it was really important that it was updated with series two of Chucky? Oh, no, it's absolutely necessary. It is representation and not for representation's sake. I mean, they have the parents talking about it. So, I mean, it's not like it just happens at the end. It's talked about throughout the movie extensively. Like you said before about how you were going through all this available information, you know, almost like a checklist. Am I this? Am I that? And it does feel like at the time, because he is referencing the old Ed Wood movie, uh, Glenn or Glenda, and that is meant to be about trans issues, but then he brings in his own transvestite issues into it. So there's already multiple identity politics going on in there. And then Don is referencing all of that in Seed. It's never said non binary in Seed of Tricky. And given the, re- the heavy reference of Glenn or Glenda, it seems like you said before you know it seems like don was trying to understand this character were they trans were they not and then later they discovered that oh they don't have to be trans they're non-binary in a way seed kind of does reflect how people are when discovering their own identities because they might think that they're one thing and then only get more information later that reveals like, oh, I got that wrong. I agree 100%. I think that it's also kind of like having two halves of a whole when you look at the two of them. He may not have even been thinking about having a trans person necessarily represented. It could have just been like two parts of yourself at war with one another, you know? And then having the, the situation split, but also isn't that what the experience is. So it kind of all encompasses, so it's, you're completely right. I think at the time, for me, the ending of Seed of Chucky, at least to me, suggested that the character of Glenn slash Glenda was schizophrenic. But I really like what they did. I certainly don't think it's a retcon. I think they worked with what they had. But I really liked what they did with the characters in Series 2 of Chucky. Do you feel that that's fair, that it 
felt a little bit like schizophrenia or do you think I'm reading it as a cis binary person? No, because I think a lot of people have those conversations where they wonder if it's schizophrenia, mental illness, or just who someone is, you know, it's a fair conversation to have. It's just the delicacy that it's handled and Don does it like chef's kiss. It's remarkable. Yeah. I think it was important that it was looked at and I'm delighted that we got a series two for him to be able to do that. Obviously we've said a hundred times, wow, wow, we've not got series three yet, but I do feel if we don't get series three, that this was something so important, I think to Don as well as to our non-binary siblings. And I think, do you know what? All of Team Rainbow or whatever I want to call it this week, queer people do want to fall under an umbrella community. And I think it's important to everybody in the queer community that this, not even mistake, but this outdated interpretation was brought up to date and it's done at least in my opinion it's done so well in series two would would you agree that it's done that well i do agree 100 percent. and do you feel that it was important to have a non-binary actor cast in the role of both glenn and glenda i'd only seen lachlan watson in sabrina before this point and they were great in that but they were so good in series two. Was it important that a non-binary person was cast for you? Absolutely, because that's the thing about representation. The more representation you get, the more opportunities. You have to have that realism in the media. So by having these people actually play these roles, just like in Sabrina, when you give these people these opportunities, they're able to set the standard for the realism and they're able to give it the nuanced portrayal that it needs because the research is already experienced. I remember when, I can't remember the character's name, it was a while ago, but I remember Lachlan Watson's character in Sabrina, when they were discovering who they were, it brought me to tears because I think for me, it was hard enough being a gay man, but it does feel to some extent being non-binary is almost like the next level for want of a less crass way of putting it. The next level. Yeah. What do you mean? Significantly more difficult than it is to come out as gay. Oh, absolutely. Because people are already kind of having difficulties having the representation because they consider it being thrown at them. You know what I mean? So to have people have that identity is a little bit difficult. But then you have an identity that's difficult to wrap your head around because what do you mean? I get the question when I do come out, quote unquote, People are like, well, what do you mean you're non-binary? What, is, what does that mean? You're not a man or a woman. Like, do you want to get an operation? Like they ask, they immediately start to ask questions and it's so difficult. <laughs> so yeah, it does kind of make people hesitant when it comes to opportunities. So it is something that you still do feel like you have to hide. Would you prefer that people ask you questions as long as it's not malicious or do you sometimes find it so tiresome that they just maybe should just leave you alone? (laughs) Um, It is tiresome sometimes, but I would rather people ask me questions that aren't malicious so that way they can learn because I feel like I can kind of take it and I do feel like I'm good at informing with patience. Mm. (laughs) Sometimes. (laughs) I have a temper, so sometimes I'll make sure I put that. <laughs> <laughs> so I really like Lachlan Watson in the role of Glenn and Glenda. And I really like how they do manage to subtly make them quite different characters, even though they're kind of supposed to be the same person. How did you feel about the nuances of the two characters of Glenn and Glenda? I couldn't understand how someone could make themselves well I mean besides Nika but be themselves but so different like if Glenn didn't have a wig and looked exactly like Glenda but they acted the same way that they are portraying the characters I would be able to tell the difference because I mean it's subtle but it's not subtle like they have their own personalities it's so distinct how do you switch that on and off 
Yeah, there's a lot of that actually in the Jockey franchise, thinking about it with, you know, Fiona Dourif and um, other people getting to play Chucky. And obviously it's different because it's not about someone's non-binary identity, but it's it's a massive challenge for everybody involved. And now, now we've been talking about it, I would have quite liked Lachlan Watson to have had a go at being Chucky as well. No. <laughs> 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 I'll take that as an absolute not agreeing with me then. <laughs> no, I am agreeing with you 100%. I love that idea. I'd love to see them back in Series 3 if we have it. What role do we think they could play, though, other than flashbacks, I guess? <sighs> that is an odd one because, yeah, it's not like Devon Sawa coming back. We really do see Lachlan Watson as these two characters. So that would be, and we've already done the whole GG reveal, so it would be hard to undo that plot point. Yeah, I think, unfortunately, it might be curtains for Lachlan Watson as part of the franchise, which is very sad. That's heartbreaking. That is a good point I I was going to ask about. We've talked about uh, Lachlan Watson and how good they were in the role. How, um, Cam, do you feel about the return of Billy Boyd in the the evolution or the new role of Gigi? How do you feel about that character? As soon as I heard the voice, I was like, oh, because there's such, there's such innocence in that voice. There's such like, even when they're being evil, I'm just like, baby. <laughs> It was warm, but like a little, like, what are you going to do now, though? Because I am concerned because they've killed a little bit more now. So, <laughs> but, but it's, it's, it's going to be cute. Nah. So that was, I had a confusing big, bit of emotions there. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but were you happy with Billy Boyd returning, considering that he isn't non-binary compared to... Lachlan Watson playing Glenn and Glenda as a non-binary actor playing non-binary characters. No, I was happy. I was very happy because it was it was his role all the way. Yeah, I did feel like that, but I, I did want to check with non-binary folk whether or not that was okay. I don't speak for us all, but I loved it. I don't have no. a problem with it. <laughs> <laughs> How did you feel about, I mean, as you'll have heard on the episode, I was livid about the spoiler at the start of the episode. How did you feel about that? Did did that ruin it for you? No, I didn't even clock it. Because ah. I get very distracted. I get very distracted. So some stuff I have to watch three or four times to see. <laughs> and then some stuff I see immediately. So I, I was surprised. I couldn't believe it. No, that's good. I'm glad you got that surprise. I was fucking livid. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, maybe that's actually a thing is, you know, on my first watch, I watch it in an analytical way because we have this podcast, whereas you just sat down and watched a thing you liked. And so maybe next year, because we're going to get season three, let's be positive. (laughs) Maybe next year, I'll try and watch it twice. Once, just sit and chill and watch. And then the next one, then I will make my notes and look at it more analytically. Do you do that, Dev, or do you just do what I do and go in straight away? Yeah, I go straight in, but I didn't notice. I don't read the credits, the opening credits. So it was just me. (laughs) I mean, I assumed he'd be back when I saw the doll, but that was about it. It's that balance, isn't it, where if you're bringing in issues like non-binaryism, you don't want to treat it with kid gloves because you want to take it seriously. You want to take, you know, you want to represent people seriously. But at the same time, you don't want to treat it too seriously because you don't want to turn it into a lecture or like a, a sermon. Nice reference. <laughs> but so by bringing, you know, Billy Boyd back, who's a, a pivotal part of the character, and even with Lachlan Watson's portrayal, it's like, you know, like just strong female characters or bad female characters. You can't make representation too dour or serious. These characters, these representations of characters also have to have fun as well. 
And it's a big part of Gigi, is that they're a very fun character. As they deserve. Yeah. <laughs> they do. They're, they're... When I first saw the doll, I was like, fuck, yes. And <laughs> I think it's so good that they managed to do what they wanted to do when it came to the, what, 20 year story arc of Glenn and Glenda and then now Gigi. I am so glad and I hope just a little bit that we get to see some Gigi again at some point. But I think if we never did, I'd also be relatively satisfied with that as well. Do you have a similar opinion or what would you like to see going forward with the character of Gigi? I'd like to see Gigi in What's Up With Jeff. I mean, how's Jeff taking this? (laughs) Does Jeff understand what's going on? Does Jeff know what's going on? (laughs) Is Gigi going to meet them overseas? I want to see it. I would like to see it. I should see it. Season three. Yeah, yeah, agree. What about you, Dave? That was going to be uh, a question I asked about... It's it's a mix of kind of representation and also writing-wise. Cam, did you feel like Gigi... Or, well, I'm not going to say Gigi as a whole. Uh, Glenn and Glenda and also Gigi. Did you feel like, as a representation of these characters, were they fully fledged? Were they living, breathing characters? Or... Did it feel like they were here just to wrap things up from Seed? No, I felt like they were fully fledged characters. I mean, I you it's it's kind of like reading a book. You know, you can impress how you feel about these characters when they're giving you something to work with, and they gave us a lot to work with. I feel as far as like figuring out who each one was. Like I could tell who was the more sensitive one, who was the one who was more daring and more able to, you know, cross the line and the one who was like going to stay back with Tiffany, you know, and somebody needs to stay with mom. Yeah. The sensitive one does. (laughs) It wasn't predictable, but they gave you something to work with. Absolutely. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Another question I had about Gigi in this example with Chucky, but with characters like Jake and Devon, they are two gay teenagers. You know, they're just two teenagers who are, uh, happen to be gay. And that's a very realistic, relatable character to relate to. Do you feel like with the popularity of a lot of modern shows like Loki, Good Omens, The Sandman, and Chucky in this instance, because I looked up non-binary characters in TV, like not just Chucky. I wanted to see how many there were. And a lot of them are kind of magical, like a lot of their reasons for non-binarism. Like Loki is non-binary because he's literally a god and he has magic powers. And there are demons and angels and all this, all these magical reasons for being non-binary. And Gigi, Glenn and Glenda are kind of the same thing. You know, they're not just non-binary because they grew up non-binary. They were literally one doll who was then split into two separate, you know, human beings. Do you feel there's still a sense of, like, otherness to these characters? Or do you feel like, I guess we sort of touched upon it with the previous question, that Gigi were were real characters. They felt like real people. I mean, if you're asking me if they're going to be seen as othered or if I feel like they are othered, I mean, yes. But that's also... I guess I don't really understand because I am othered in my life no matter what. So it's kind of just an experience I sit with. I don't know if I notice it. That's that's very true. I just saw it or noticed it as a more heightened otherness. You know, uh, we can have gay characters who are just gay because that's real life. Whereas a lot of these non-binary characters are non-binary because of otherworldly reasons. I I would say that, um, like you you said before, Lachlan Watson does a fantastic job at bringing the humanity to these characters. So I do, I do feel like this season, a whole season of this, it does. Uh, there's enough relatability to these characters. 
yeah, if somebody else did it, it may not have translated as well and as naturally. Mm. So is there anything else you wanted to talk about with us that you wanted to bring to the table that we haven't already covered? No, not besides insane compliments of this podcast. Oh, oh I love you guys. I've been listening to you for <laughs> a year you. now. Like, you got me through some <laughs> tough times, people. No, you guys really speak on a lot of amazing points. I do know I wanted to say, Mark, your love of Jason X. Yes, 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 you're right. <laughs> it's the best one. It's, it's the best so one. It, it's just, I was looking for so my Jason X shirt earlier. It is so <laughs> dumb, but it knows what it is. Frozen head smash death. Yes, like, agreed. Agreed. The fact that you have a Jason X top makes me so jealous. I'm like a member of like Chucky fan forums and Facebook groups and stuff. And people that live in the States get so much cool merch. The only Chucky merch I have ever seen was a slightly badly designed Chucky t-shirt in Tesco. And obviously I bought it, but that's the only Chucky merch I've ever seen. And I'm wearing my good guy shirt right now. Oh, jealousy. <laughs> Pure I will, Okay, jealousy. how about this? I will go to the store. I will get that top. You send me a P.O. box to send it to you. I got it because I saw it yesterday at the store. <laughs> I may take you up on that. Free shirt, man. Free days and next. So, Cam, it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast. Where can people find you, follow you on the internet if they wanted to say hello? I love Chucky too. Hello, I love Chucky too. And you can find me at Bayou Queer on twitter and on instagram perfect <laughs> thank you again for being part of chucky vision and i think this has been a brilliant chat thanks for listening to a chat about non-binary representation in chucky series two we're back very soon with a similar chat about catholicism in series two of chucky if you want to get us on social media I'm on at Mark Adams HC and Dev is on at Absolute Travesty and the podcast itself is on at Chucky Vision. We only do Twitter because I don't like Instagram. So thanks again for listening and until next time, wanna play? Chucky Vision is a podcast brought to you by the We Made This Network. Follow us on Twitter at Chucky Vision. Follow the network on Twitter at WMT underscore network. Our website is we made this network.com. The logo was designed by Dev and the theme tune composed by Dark Fantasy Studio. Wanna play? Hi, I'm Colin. I'm Ian. And I'm Tracy. And we dig music. Just not always the same music. Each episode, we pick our ten favourite songs from a specific year, rate them, and then battle it out over a top 30 countdown. Colin's pretty enthusiastic about most stuff, Ian less so. And Tracy definitely owns a thesaurus. And one of us will regularly be told to f*** off. <laughs> so join us each month to hear what we dig and what we don't. Listen to We Dig Music wherever you get your podcasts. Find us on WeDigPodcast.com or we're on the We Made This Podcast Network, which you can find at WeMadeThisNetwork.com.